Thank you for inviting me. <coughs> if I'm growling a bit, it's because uh, I've had flu for about the last week, and I can't get, really get rid of it. But I'm very glad to have been invited. Thank you, Lynn. And thank you, Irene. Especially for making the set blue. That's nice. <laughs> I feel like a bit of a fraud here, to be quite honest, because I know absolutely nothing about data visualization. <laughs> I, I mean, I mean it. But let's just get this out of the way quickly. <laughs> <coughs> <laughs> you are aware, I hope, that you've invited the person whose work Tufty called the chart junk. And uh, thank you. <coughs> in this uh, extremely rude piece that he wrote, <laughs> in, his second, in his second book, he's talking about this, this piece, uh, unsavory exhibit at right. Lurking behind chart junk is contempt both for information and for the audience. Chart junk promotes promoters. Imagine that numbers and details are boring, dull, and tedious, requiring ornament to enliven. Worse is contempt for our audience, designing as if readers were obtuse and uncaring. Hmm. <laughs> contempt for the audience, hey? I'd love to know what Tufty would actually say about something like this. Might he call this chart junk? Now, I have no more right to criticize this piece by Stefan Brottigam than Tufty had to take my piece out of context. I have no right at all. Which brings me to this point. The context is what matters. The context <laughs> is what matters. He ripped me out of a magazine. If you're watching carefully, and if you've got his second book, you'll see that this actually wasn't the piece that he used. He used the colored version from my book, which the publisher asked me to color for the back of it. He took my name off it, he took Time's name off it, and in tiny print, in the back of his book, he said, used with permission. But it wasn't, because I would, the person who was, would have given permission to use. This is a long time ago. <laughs> I'm still going on about it. <laughs> but here I am in a magazine, and here is that Brodigan piece in a book, which is where I saw it, in Dataflow. Perhaps if I'd seen it, maybe, in an art gallery, I would have had a different thought about it. Or, you know, much more importantly, if I'd seen it online, where I could interact with it, which is probably where it was supposed to be seen, but it, but it isn't was it, where, where it was seen. The context makes a huge amount of difference. So whether you are reading a thing in print seeing it in a gallery, or interacting with it on a computer, the context makes the difference. What's common to all of these things is that people have to interact with it or look at it. And I found that the best way to connect is by making people smile. Not funny, not laugh, but a smile of recognition about something. I was asked a few years ago to redesign the US currency. I thought maybe the best way was just to go for it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> You're very kind. And on the back, because there was a back to each bill, you know. I'd write a story. Bonnie and Clyde here for the $1 bill. 
We thought Al Capone, maybe, for the $100 bill. <laughs> but the key to this piece, for me, is not just that it says cash, but it's got these little cut-off corners on it, so that when you have it in your hand, it actually looks like you've got a lot more. <laughs> So I'm trying to be friendly, to be approachable, to tap into other people's emotions, to use humor in the sense of good humor, of good feelings, of good feelings and emotions. Emotions, a very difficult thing to square with what I am in in one sense, which is a kind of journalism. But emotions are important. Your intellect may be confused, but your emotions never lie to you. And I want to appeal in this kind of human way because seldom does your audience know everything. They may be confused. Look at this great ad about paralysis. Do this with me. With your ring finger extended, come on. You've got to find something to put it on. Ring finger extended, rest of the fingers back. It's actually quite hard even to do that. Put it down on some hard surface. And now try to lift it, just that finger. And you can't. That's what it feels like to be paralyzed. That's a great ad. That's a great interactive ad. I was born in England, grew up in England. And in England, we have awful food. I am horrified to tell you that this is available here if you want to try it. But I don't actually recommend it. What? I was very happy to swap this for this when I came to America. Walter Bernard, my great sponsor and helper at <laughs> time, granted me an artistic license, and I used it. <laughs> this is from 19, actually quite late, 1989. I'd been there quite a bit. This map did not run in time because a cohort of the staff threatened to resign. This is about pro-choice, pro-life battleground states in the abortion war in 1989. We ran a very straightforward map. But I did other things that were pretty bad. I don't think I would do them now. <laughs> Except that if you are old enough to remember, the gas lines were enormous in 1982. And we were annoyed because of what we suspected was happening here. Now, this is, you know, racist and uh, would not, I mean, I would have been fired, I think. I, there were letters to Time saying, if Mr. Holmes wants to be a cartoonist, please let him go and do that. But, you know what? I got email, I got, I didn't get emails, I got fan mail, I got, actual mail from people who said, wow, now I see it. Best thing an information designer can hear. Now I see it. Meaning, understand it. You just excuse me a minute, I'm gonna get a little water. Not the best image to leave you with. Not everything was really that bad. This is a piece about the state of gen the genome uh, 
science in 1994, just as I was leaving time. And then I got uh, a regular job with a magazine called Attaché, which was US Air's very nicely designed in-flight magazine. And every week, every month, rather, I had to do a how it works. This was how you hear. And I started to develop a way of having little people who were kind of commenting on the action or were part of the action, like this. Uh, and I would occasionally put the characters down at the bottom like this, and they would be making a comment about the graphic. It was kind of another level to help people with questions that they may have, like the woman here, sorry to be sexist about this, but the woman is saying, it looks rather simple, and the mechanic is saying, well, you know, I have left some things out. But I think that's the point. This audience is sitting in a plane. They have no time. They're just flicking through. They're waiting for the nuts to come or something like that. <laughs> and I had to appeal to them quickly. This is for Discover magazine. Same kind of thing. Very complicated pieces. That this I worked very closely with Michio Kaku and uh, the, the scientist. <coughs> and he was very good, very generous with his time. And, when, and we went through the science very carefully. National Geographic, the amount of carbon in the atmosphere, and we're drowning in it. When facts are really amazing, you just play it straight, you know how to escape from an alligator or a crocodile. This is from my second to latest book. Uh, and here's what you do, by the way. <laughs> Crocodiles and alligators have this flap in their mouth, which they push back against their here. They push it back to stop water going in while they are eating you. <laughs> and so what you do is you put your arm or your leg, if he's got your leg, then just use your leg. But if you put your arm into the mouth and pull the flap down, pull the flap down, so the water rushes in and the animal drowns. Now, I'm, I'm not an animals, animal rights person here, but this is an occasion when it's okay to drown a crocodile. <laughs> But, and it is a big, hairy but, <laughs> <coughs> academics hate this approach. Some think that I'm trivializing information, but I'm not. I'm simply trying to popularize information. And that violates a certain academic mindset. It violates a code of secrecy, a use of jargon that excludes civilians who are not members of their exclusive club. Just because a thing is serious, does that make it authoritative? I ask you. <laughs> or just because a thing is light-hearted, does that mean it's not serious? I mean, who gets their news from John Stewart and John Oliver these days? John Oliver actually calls his work investigative comedy. And it happens in art. Just this last week, not week, this last, during this last month, a wonderful sculptor called William King died. He does beautiful work. But let me read you from his obituary here in the Times. The comic element of his work probably caused his reputation to suffer. He was being funny. Happens in architecture. Here is Michael Graves, also died within the last month. Better known now for this. 
and the things that he made for Target. Let me read you from his obituary. This Unitarian direction arguably lost graves some ground in his profession. He chose to go populist and commercial. Hmm. The worst people of all are scientists. In 1979, I did this piece for Time magazine, and the man who I was working with, was a man, was apoplectic when I sent him sketch. He said, you are going to reduce my work on interferon to a cartoon <laughs> in Time magazine, which at that time had about four million readers. Yes, I said. I, you know, I, if it, today I would have said, what, you're going to do something to me? <laughs> Within a week, he wrote to me and said, thank you. I've had so many letters from people saying, now I understand what you do. <laughs> here's a piece about stem cells that I did for Stanford University. Look at this bit at the bottom here. It is possible during the separation and the work that you do with stem cells that you will end up with a thing that potentially could make a human being. The scientist who I was working with here was apoplectic. And I sent him this sketch. Threatened that to actually sue the university if they ran it. So we didn't run it. Best example for me of how pictures speak louder than words. In addition to this academic reluctance to allow regular humans to take part in understanding, <laughs> we are being seduced by technology. Here's how I formulate the difference, and this is a bit rude to you, I'm afraid. I say about data visualization people, this is what they may be thinking or saying. Perfectly fine, okay? The background that I come from, information graphics, is what we say is, what's the story? I'll use the data, but what's the story? So the data visualizer maybe is the data-rich porcupine. <laughs> Many Linus bewilder us. <laughs> That's the official Latin <laughs> word for it. <clears throat> and the information graphics designer is the edited zebra. <laughs> Infographicus understander. The key difference here is editing. This is a piece that you all know. And again, I cannot criticize this because I'm not interacting with it. But I've seen it all over the place. And students see this and they say, oh, this is what we do. Wrong. The difference is editing which is not the same as simplifying. Simplify is that dangerous word that I hate to use. I prefer this word. And here is a beautifully edited piece of data visualization to me. This appears every day in the New York Times and it tells you very efficiently what the weather is going to be, what it has been, what the highs and lows records are, what the uh, 
normal highs and lows are. It's a fantastic piece of work. Runs every day unheralded completely. But this, to me, is the closest that I can come to, being, to, to showing you something that I think really has approached the audience and said, we want you to understand us. This is a different story. This is not edited at all. It's there because we have all this stuff. <laughs> now, if there is a chance that your work might appear in print, do two versions. I had to do some work for a uh, e-book, and they wanted a demonstration of print and of video. So I did the print thing, and then I did the video. Wait. I love cheese. Just love it. And I used to wonder if there was some scientific reason that could explain why. You know, some important sounding excuse I could use to account for my craving. Here's what I found. We all know that cheese is made from milk. It's basically a concentrate of protein called casein and fat. You eat cheese. Mm, yes! It goes down to the stomach. It sloshes around in the juices there, which start to digest it. And in the process, casein is transformed into casomorphin. And that's a chemical cousin of morphine, or opium. The addiction-inducing casomorphin travels up to the brain, which says, this is great stuff, eat more of it. Well, it's as simple as that. And now I know why I love cheese. I'm addicted to it. That's my son who does the animation. Beautiful soundtrack as well. Walk mm. great. <laughs> different versions for different media, please. I wonder what this would have looked like. <laughs> if it was a different version. Actually, I'm not going to tell you any more about that. You probably know it. But you know, we have always been seduced by technology or by the new trendy thing. For instance, someone who was trying, who was crazy about technology and about the latest inventions was Mozart. Now when Mozart was young, terribly young. He, uh, he composed music, as you may know. And listen to this piece, and listen just that there is no piano. doing when you were eight? <laughs> this is what I was. <laughs> now the piano, that, that was uh, 1765. The piano was invented in 1780. And you notice the white notes are black and the black notes are white. <clears throat> and it was called the forte piano because for the first time now you could, you could actually hear the thing, uh, as opposed to a harpsichord which plucked strings. Here, there was some depth to the, to, to the, to the tone. 1780, took Mozart a couple of years, wrote for the piano. Very nice. 
I'll, I'll cut it off for time. But in 1790, Mozart went to uh, a concert by Anton Mesmer, what Lena was talking about earlier, Mesmerism. And uh, Mesmer not only did this, which is, looks like he's spraying salt into somebody's face, <coughs> but he, he actually invented a thing called the glass harmonica, which is a terribly difficult instrument to play. It's glasses filled with di to different heights with uh, water or wine or whatever. And uh, so Mozart invented for this. And uh, it is an awful piece of music, but <coughs> this is because he didn't quite understand the technology. Just, just listen to this. Uh, to begin with, this is perfectly nice. And then you'll hear... <laughs> you won't hear that on any mostly Mozart festival. <laughs> ben Franklin actually invented a, play, a playable one, uh, which would have saved him a lot of trouble. And of course, if this had been invented, <laughs> Mozart would have definitely composed for it. This is the cat piano, which you can, believe it or not, get on your iPhone. And uh, it sounds like this. <laughs> Why are you laughing? This is the this is the, one of the national anthems. Mozart got the technology wrong. In deference to my heroes at the New York Times, and I think they were playing a joke, really, this beautiful yield curve here, they decided they'd print it out in three dimensions. Well, OK, it was fun. OK, I feel completely analog in, a, uh, in this digital world. I've got one minute to see if I can get this done. Would you let me go over just a tiny bit? Six people, please, up here and come and stand right here. I'm not going to make a fool of you. OK, no, no, they're, they're there. Six, one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yes, perfect. All right. Now, what we're going to do is we are going to set up a scale here which is uh, from uh, today, oh, it's about million, billion, and trillion. Okay, well, since I don't have my notes, I didn't know what was coming next. <laughs> million, billion, trillion, the difference between these numbers. So we're going to set up today. So will you be today, and you just stand right okay. here, and you don't have to do anything else. I'm good. All right, you're good. Would you come with me? Oh, that's here. Right. You come with me, and you're 16,000 years ago. You stand right here in the middle. Okay. That's good. Yeah. 16,000 years ago, when the Chauvet caves were being painted. Will you come and stand at the other end, please? 32,000 years ago. A little bit further. Which is when, sorry, this is the Chauvet. The other ones were the Lasco. Big, big uh, art movement there, by the way. <laughs> Much the same art, 16,000 years. OK, now, we're going to find out the difference in seconds. Now, so who knows what, what number is this? Oh. <laughs> How long ago do you think a million seconds was? 
Today, 16,000 years ago, 32. What do you think? In the middle? Have a go. Okay, this is 16,000 years ago. You're about 8,000 years. Uh, it's 12 days. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. All right. What number is this? A billion. Thank you. Billion seconds ago, how long do you think? How long do you think it is? Well, 12,000, it's 32 years. So you're at 8,000 years. <laughs> you're at 4,000 years now. You're at, he's at about 2,000 years. You're on top of each other, guys. 32 years ago. Who's 32 here? Anybody 32? Happy birthday. You're a billion seconds old. 32 years ago, Microsoft Word was just in, in, unveiled. And, and the mass. Trillion. Where would you go? He told me to go down there. <laughs> go down there. Okay. Who knows the answer here? Because it's a thousand times more. It's 32,000 years is a trillion seconds. We think we know numbers, right? These people are all on top of each other. <laughs> a trillion. And we throw these numbers around. We have done, been doing today. I'm sorry about 16 years. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so innocent. We should write it like this. <laughs> Thank you for listening. And may you all live to 122 years, or 3.8 billion seconds, like Jean Calment, the person who has been recorded with the longest life in uh, human history.